Good day and salutations. Today's briefing, Australia's Marine Corps, the ADF after the Defence Strategic Review. First, an update on the channel, my internet access is not consistent, so while I continue to produce a briefing each week, I may not be able to upload it each week. So please hit the bell icon to be notified of when I am able to uh, post a new briefing. Australia has released the public version of its Defence Strategic Review. What does this mean for the future of the Australian Defence Force, the ADF? While not explicitly highlighting China, it is far and away the primary driver for the recommendations of the review. According to the review, the ADF's current force structure is not fit for purpose for our current strategic circumstances. The ADF must move from a joint to an integrated focused force with long range strike from all domains. As I suggested in my DSR preview briefing, the DSR needed to explain why Australia was purchasing nuclear powered attack submarines and HIMARS multiple launch rocket systems and how the Army was to be employed without adequate infantry fighting vehicles, IFDs, if it reduced planned numbers. It also needed to cover other important aspects such as foreign forces deploying into Australia, improvements to northern infrastructure, including air bases, and munitions. This briefing will examine how the DSR covered these and other questions. Where and how will the ADF operate? Well, Australia's area of primary defence interest is the northeastern Indian Ocean through maritime Southeast Asia into the Pacific. This region includes our northern approaches, states the review. Australia's approach to operating in these areas is to be a strategy of denial. Australia will achieve this through long-range strike capability, undersea warfare and surface-to-air missiles. But Australia does not plan to operate alone. Australia's alliance with the US has become increasingly more important. There will be increased bilateral planning, increased US force posture in Australia and joint patrols with the US. What does this mean for equipment and force structure? Well, nuclear powered attack submarines. The Defence Strategic Review did not announce how many SSNs will be procured, nor did it explain the requirement for this capability. Indeed, an argument can be made that they are inconsistent with the ADF's area of primary defence interest, as stated in the review. Additionally, naval bases on the east and west coasts will be developed so that they can support not only the Royal Australian Navy's SSNs, but also those of the UK and the US. Other naval developments were not unexpected. As I suggested in the DSR preview briefing, the Hunter-class frigates were likely to come under scrutiny. A total of nine were planned to be acquired. The question I asked was, do these frigates, which are actually larger than the Navy's Hobart-class destroyers, meet the ADF's requirements in this new future? With another review to be conducted, this time into the surface fleet mix, it is likely not all nine will be procured, instead more likely six, although it could be as low as three. Instead, tier two vessels, likely large corvettes, will be invested in. While there are no details as yet, these vessels will perhaps be in the range of 2,000 to 4,000 tonne displacement. It is likely that if corvettes are to be procured, more of them will be built than the number of hunter-class frigates that are cancelled. The Navy is also to finally receive a replacement for the long retired landing craft heavies, LCHs. The planned replacement is to be significantly larger than the LCHs, perhaps in the 3,000 to 4,000 tonne range, and likely not in service before 2031. So the Navy in summary, the surface fleet will be restructured into two tiers. Tier 1 and Tier 2 vessels will have long-range strike capability. Be likely less hunter-class frigates, but with the addition of large corvettes. There will be a replacement for the landing craft heavies and an unknown number of SSNs. Perhaps the most significant and not unexpected capability announcement relates to the Army's Infantry Fighting Vehicle, or IFV, program. The original requirement was for 450 IFEs, 
enough for three mechanised infantry battalions, one in each of the Army's three regular combat brigades. 450 was the number required to equally and appropriately equip the three battalions, together with training vehicles and attrition reserve. Given the already significant investment across the other armoured vehicle capabilities, including tanks, see separate briefing link below, such a reduction would be curious. The four structure changes to the Army explain why this decision has been made. Instead of having three mechanised infantry battalions, the Army is likely to have only one, which would be part of a single armoured combined arms brigade for amphibious operations. If the Army maintains armoured cavalry regiment structure as it currently has, the M113 AS4s in that formation might also be replaced by the new IFVs. What this decision means is that the Army won't be able to sustain a mechanised infantry force for very long, and that what it can be deployed will be small. Two important questions remain. Will the M113 AS4s remain in service? And what will the role and structure of the Army's other two brigades be? The DSR shed more light on the acquisition of the HIMARS multiple launch rocket system. It will be a central part of the Army's enhanced focus on littoral operations, providing the Army with long-range maritime strike. It is clear now why the Army went for the M142 HIMARS instead of the M270 MLRS, due to it being able to deploy faster and in greater numbers due to its lighter weight. Perhaps mirroring the US Marine Corps littoral regiments, the Army will be able to deploy the HIMARS to islands together with service to air missile systems and infantry protection. The review goes on to say that more HIMARS may be purchased. To deploy this force, the Army is fundamentally changing its approach to littoral manoeuvre through Project Land 8710 Phase 1, replacing the Army's current 15 LCM-8s, landing craft mechanised, with 18 larger and longer ranged littoral manoeuvre vessels medium. These will be large enough to project out into the region without needing to be transported. They will be large enough to carry everything up to and including a tank and other equipment the Army will bring into service. These vessels can operate independently from the Canberra Cars landing helicopter docks. The intention is to launch the LMVMs from Darwin and Townsville into the near region to support forces operating in littoral and riverine environments. The Army will also replace the five-tonne Lark 5s, lighter amphibious resupply cargo, with a similar craft, the littoral manoeuvre vessel Light, beginning in 2026. In summary for the Army, the Army's three combat brigades will be re-rolled. There will be a single armoured combined arms brigade for amphibious operations. Two battalions worth of infantry fighting vehicles will be cancelled as will the 2nd Regiment of self-propelled howitzers. Additional HIMARS multiple launch rocket systems will likely be procured and they will accelerate and expand the acquisition of medium and light landing craft. While there was no mention of additional F-35s beyond the existing order of 72, they are likely to be up, they will be upgraded to Block 4 configuration and equipped with the Joint Strike Missile. The long-range anti-ship missile will also be integrated onto the F-35s and the F-A-18Fs as well, suggesting these aircraft will stay in service for some time. An anticipated announcement concerned the future of the MQ-28 Ghostbat UCAV. The review recommends this largely domestic program should be a priority for the development with the US. Should it progress to operational status, it is likely this would not occur before 2031. The B-21 Raider Stealth Bomber had been suggested as a possible addition to the ADF. The review investigated the B-21 Raider as a potential capability option for Australia. Given the approach to defence strategy and capability development outlined in the review, the B-21 was not considered to be a suitable op option for consideration for acquisition. While the ADF is not to purchase the B-21 bomber, 
RAF Base Tyndall is being upgraded so US bombers can operate from it. Uh, overall ADF summary, for the Navy, a two-tiered surface fleet with long-range strike. The Army, a fully enabled, integrated, amphibious capable combined arms land system. Transformed and optimised for littoral manoeuvre operations by sea, land and air from Australia with land-based maritime strike. For the Air Force, a networked expeditionary air operations capability with long-range strike optimised for the support of maritime and littoral operations. And from a joint perspective, a layered integrate air and missile defence capability to be rapidly expedited. But the DSR didn't only cover equipment. In terms of infrastructure, the review noted that it was imperative that the network of northern bases is urgently and comprehensively remediated. The priority for this work is the series of critical air bases. This series of northern air bases must now be viewed as a holistic capability system with immediate and comprehensive work required on these air bases, including runway and apron capacity, aviation fuel supply and storage, hardening and weapon storage. The key line of forward deployment for the ADF stretches across Australia's northern maritime approaches. Integral to the ADF's force posture is the network of bases, ports and barracks stretching in Australia's territory from Cocos or Keeling Island through the RAF bases of Learmonth, Curtin, Darwin, Tyndall, Sherga and Townsville and the naval facilities at Darwin and Cairns. It is likely the potential acquisition of corvettes will see them home ported in Darwin and perhaps Cairns, together with the Army's new landing craft. The Army will also move the future AH-64E Apache attack helicopters to Townsville, co-locating them with the UH-60M Blackhawks and CH-47 Chinooks, possibly meaning the 3rd Brigade will re-roll into a focused air assault brigade. ADF facilities are also being developed and expanded to support allies. These include Darwin for US Marines, Tyndall for the US Air Force, and West and East Coast facilities for US and UK SSNs. These facilities will likely become high value targets to an adversary. The logistics or war stocks issue was addressed in the DSR, and not only munitions but other critical supplies. Maintaining appropriate levels of war stocks has never been a strong suit for Australia, and the conflict in Europe has only reinforced the importance for Australia. The ability to domestically manufacture advanced munitions, especially in long-range guided weapons, is a significant development. Finally, Australia's Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The DSR talks about national defence, but doesn't address this issue. It does discuss the establishment of a fuel council, which is significant, but it does not address the issue of Australia's limited petroleum reserves. Australia is required to hold 90 days worth of oil imports as emergency stocks, yet Australia rarely achieves more than 60 days. This could be significant in a protracted conflict that includes maritime Southeast Asia. In terms of timelines for deliveries of capabilities, the review explains three timeframes where certain capabilities need to be achieved. First, the enhanced force in being refers to the current ADF with enhancements that can be achieved in the period 2023 to 2025, including the fitting of longer ranged and more lethal weapons onto existing platforms, the hardening of command and control networks and bases, and where possible, the early delivery of relevant priority in-train capability projects. This suggests 2026 as the start of a time of significant concern for defence planners. The objective integrated force is to be realised through the acceleration or addition of new capabilities in line with the force structure priorities and guidance outlined in the review, suggesting high priority capabilities that are to be realised as soon as possible but can't meet a 2026 timeframe. The future integrated force is the long-term design of the integrated force from 2031 and beyond. 
It will provide an objective aim point for all domains and enablers to achieve an integrated force that is fit for the strategic circumstances and in line with defence planning framework, which will mean whatever the government of the day wants it to mean. In summary, the Army appears to be morphing into something like the US Marine Corps, although one that has a heavier land formation in the form of an armoured combined arms brigade. The Army will be designed to deploy and fight in the littoral environment, but with likely one of each of three very different combat brigades. Will the Army be able to deploy, uh, maintain and deploy a level of capability for a sufficient period of time? The Navy's restructure to a two-tiered surface fleet should see more surface vessels and a significant increase in sea-based long-range strike, perhaps to the detriment of the range of the Tier 2 vessels but that would be consistent with the outline strategy. The Air Force will be optimised to support the Navy and Army in the maritime and littoral operations, and not designed for deep strike on an adversary's homeland. Nothing in the review means that the ADF can't, or won't, operate further afield than the area of primary defence interest. There does appear to be a general lightening of the ADF. And there is an old saying, there's no use getting there fast, if all you achieve is your own destruction. Will the ADF's new focused force influence China, China's decision making? No. Is a restructured ADF needed? Yes. That concludes today's briefing. Uh, thank you for watching. Happy to take suggestions for future briefings from subscribers, so please subscribe, like, and share. Until next time, Vale de Cerro.